setting up a new watercolour palette. That's what I'm going to show you how to do today because I've got some new paints. These are Jackman's Art Materials, a completely new British brand. Welcome back to my channel. If we haven't met before, my name is Michelle and on this channel you'll find lots of watercolour and mixed media tips and techniques as well as some drawing techniques a little bit of business, social media and online selling for artists, so please do consider subscribing. If you click the bell notification, you'll get notified each time I have a new video for you. So it's not unusual for me to be sent new art materials and new products to try out. However, it is unusual for me to be sent a completely new brand. This brand of paints is so new, I was literally a couple of weeks ago waiting for them to finish printing the labels before they sent them to me. So this is Jackman's Art Materials and I have 12 new watercolours to try out. And um, here's something a bit unusual right from the start. They've got flip top caps. So very interesting. Very excited to try out these new paint pigments. I'm also going to be showing you today how to lay out a watercolour palette if you've got a new set of paints or perhaps if you just want to organise the ones you already own. I'm going to show you how to set out that palette and also explain to you why it's a good idea to squeeze your tube paints into a palette in the first place. So in a moment I'm going to point the camera downwards and show you the new paints and show you how I lay out my palettes. However, in terms of transparency, is that a watercolour joke? In terms of transparency, I must point out that although this is not a sponsored video, I have not been paid for this review, I was sent the paints free of charge. However, I will be giving you my completely honest opinion. It would not be worth my reputation to do anything else. So we're looking down at my new set of paints and there are 12 of them, um, one of which is white. Now, I generally keep white because white is usually um, a form of gouache. I normally keep my white paint separate entirely to my watercolour palettes and that's so that I don't get white paint in everything. Now I do use white paint occasionally but it's generally not used for the majority of watercolour painting which is considered to be a transparent medium. So if you have a nice white like this what I would suggest you do is put it in a separate palette and then just use it as and when you need to. And I will be doing some videos coming up because um, a lot of people get into trouble with white. You don't want to start using white when you're a complete beginner. There are ways of using it with watercolour painting where it doesn't muddy everything up. So I'll be doing some videos about that coming up. But for now, what I would do, um, we will try this white out in a minute. We've got some dried paint. We'll see how uh, nice and opaque it is. What I do is keep your white in a separate little dish. Let's have a look at the palettes I'm going to use. And then we'll start with making some swatches of these and laying them out properly in the watercolour palettes. Now, depending, the sort of palette you choose depends on how many paints you've got. Now, I've got 12 here, so I'm going to use a square palette. So I've got an old one laying around, which I've cleaned out, still slightly stained, but it's perfectly good. And this is the palette I'm going to use to put these new Jackman's um, paints in. And that means that going forward, I'll be able to make a video with um, a painting that I do entirely from these paints and know that they're all in the same place. Now... Years ago when I started painting, um, first of all I started just putting paints out randomly in palettes and then couldn't remember which colour was which because when the, especially the dark colours, you can't tell which is which when they're dried. Then I thought I would be a bit more methodical. So this, um, again, this is a very old palette, it's not been cleaned and um, I only use it really now when I'm demonstrating at classes just to use the colours up. In this palette I've got primaries here, so I've got yellow, blue, red. It's handy to have the yellow and the blue next to each other because you'll be mixing a lot of greens either for flower painting or for landscapes. And then I've got my reds and I think I kept my earth colours separately. So this is a similar palette layout to, um, to what I'm going to use today. I'm going to start with the, uh, the primary colours and then have the earth colours and the secondary colours. Now what I do now because I have a lot more paints, I have at least 48 in my um, my regular palettes and people keep sending me more it's just fantastic and I'll, I just need the biggest paint palette in the world I think what I do now is I keep them in these palettes so I've got four of these palettes now I'll link to all of these palettes um, in the description below so you can uh, you can buy those if you'd like to so what I've got here now is I've got my primaries each in a single um, palette along with a secondary that I consider to be somewhat related. So here I've got my yellows going from cool to warm and then next to them I've got a few ready-made greens. In this palette here 
I've got my pinks and reds going into oranges. In this palette here, I've got my blues going from um, sort of turquoisey blues up to um, you know very strong dark blues like indigo, and then I've got some ready mixed purples and violets. And then in my last palette, I have earth colours and neutrals. So if you think you're going to have a lot of paints, that's another good way of doing it. But whether you're using these you know individual palettes or one big palette you still want to be thinking about having your primary colors then your secondary colors and then your neutrals now if you're wondering which are primaries and which are secondaries i have got a video on um, which are the primary colors um, technically it's it's a difficult thing to explain but from an artist's point of view rather than a scientist's point of view your primaries would be red yellow blue and then your secondaries would be purple orange green and then earth colors are literally what they say some of them are still made from earth and you've got things like siennas and ochres just to make it a bit more confusing we have things like yellow ochres technically considered to be an earth color but because it's so yellow i like to include it in with my yellows now another one that i use um, which we don't have from jackman's today but another color which you may commonly have is Payne's gray and here you'll see that Payne's gray is in with my blues and that's because it has majority blue pigment and will mix somewhat like a blue so you know these are decisions do you put your yellow ochre in with your earth colors or in with your yellows do you put your Payne's gray in with your neutrals or in with your blues it doesn't matter as long as you know where they are and you understand what their you know what their uses are then um, you'll be uh, a lot more organized than probably if you're just putting them in randomly so I'm going to start by putting my yellows out. I do hope you can see well enough today. I'll do my absolute best with light levels. Unfortunately, um, it's very, very poor light here in the UK at the moment. It's just after Christmas and we've unusually we've had an awful lot of, of rain. Um, I'm in the south of England. We normally don't get much rain, but it's been pouring. We have flooding everywhere and the light just isn't good. So I'll do my best with this, but I'll be using these paints in other videos too. So you'll get a good look at them. Um, so I've got my cadmium yellow. Now the first thing to notice about these paints is the caps are unusual and this is one of the things that really drew me to them in the first place is that the caps actually flip open. Now I don't know about you but I have had countless um, adventures with watercolour tubes with the lids stuck on. Now with acrylics all you have to do is upend them in some warm water and the paint melts but that doesn't work for watercolour. You have to kind of hack at them with a knife and try and loosen them off. So this could be something really interesting. Now, how well these caps work long term once the paint starts to be squeezed out, I can't say. I might have to tell you about that in a future video. But just on first impressions, what a fantastic idea, a flip top cap. And they really close with a click as well. So it doesn't seem to me like, um, you know, there would be any leakage. Now, the paints themselves come sealed, as some paints do, and they have to be pierced. So um, what's going to happen when I pierce this one um, from a previous experience with watercolour paints and also because I opened one of the greens is a load's going to squirt out. Now this is not unusual, this happens with lots of brands. Sometimes they're flown in from other countries and sometimes they just get a bit compressed during the process of putting them in the tubes. Now if you're not going to use a palette, you know, what a waste of paint, you're going to squeeze that paint out and um, you're not going to be able to keep it. So. What I've got here is just a sharp implement. This is actually a lino tool, um, which I'm using today because I thought while I'm trying to film and, and do two things at once, if I was to use a knife, I'm like to stab myself. So you can use a craft knife. I've opened one of these already. They're not difficult to get through. So you can use a craft knife or you can use any pointed tool at all, like a lino tool, or if you've got one, a ruling pen, or even the end of a little paintbrush will go through. So what I'm going to do is pierce this. I'm going to do it over the palette so that I can tip the paint in when it squeezes out. There we go. Straight in, give it a twist. Oh, there you go. It's me saying it would squirt out. Sometimes it does. This one hasn't. What I actually do with my... Um, paint pans like this people often put out too little paint now if you just put the tiny tiny amount out you know it's it's really rather sort of uh, I was moaning my students being rather cheapskate with their paints it's not like acrylic it won't waste it'll keep for ages um, I mean I've kept it for decades before now it's been usable so fill your little pan up and what will happen eventually 
is they will set hard. So here's one of my paints that's set hard. Now this is a huge advantage. Now what you're almost doing is making pan paints. And what happens then is if you get muck on one of your paints, you can literally just scrub it and get the uh, get the muck off of it. Whereas if the paint is wet like this, and you put, say I put a paintbrush in there with some green paint on, I stick it straight in the middle of that paint. All of that paint is now polluted with color rather than it just being on the surface. So that's a good reason to put your paints out like this. And it also, because tubes are so great, it gives you the option of squeezing fresh tube paint out into one of these nice big wells when you need it. And that's why I always choose these paint palettes that have large wells like this. The ones with the tiny wells, no good for mixing. So you've squeezed them out. They'll take about two or three days to dry, so don't tip them up once you've uh, once you've squeezed them out. And when I say two or three days, obviously if you're living in a very humid climate, that could take much longer, but eventually they will set like this. Now some brands will tell you that they're not suitable for doing this, um, you know, whatever. I've done it with all brands and I think they're just being a bit picky really. It seems to work fine. So that's what I'm going to do here. But I'm also now going to try out this colour. So I've got some swatches of watercolour paint. So let's try out this lemon yellow first of all. So the first thing I notice is that it's really really bright and fresh. I want something to compare it against so I'm just going to grab a little bit off camera of my um, Talons Rembrandt. So here I've painted some of the uh, Talons Rembrandt lemon yellow that I've got. It's a cadmium lemon yellow and very very similar actually. The Talons one appears like it might be slightly more greenish but as I said the light levels in the uh, in the studio are very uh, very poor at the moment. Sometimes it's nice to have a lemon that isn't too green because you can paint flowers like primroses without getting that sort of that acid tone in them. A lemon regardless is a really really important colour to have in your palette because it enables the mixing of some really bright greens. I'm going to do a video coming up where I um, make colour charts for you and what we'll do is with these Jackman's paints we'll water them right the way down and see how they look when they're um, fully sort of you know as dark as possible right down to as light as possible but in the meantime a really lovely bright lemon yellow. So next up we've got yellow ochre technically an earth colour but like I said at the beginning I do keep it with my uh, with my yellows. It can be a very dull color and it is often a slightly opaque heavily granulating color really useful however for things like beaches it will need a bit of adjusting it can be too bright on its own but for beaches and sandy paths and things like that a really useful color it will also mix some really dull muddy greens um, if you imagine sort of something like a kiwi fruit the outside of a kiwi fruit that's the sort of green that you can mix using yellow ochre so this is the Jackman's one, and actually I'm quite impressed with, with how bright the colour is for an ochre. And um, I'll try it out actually against my Talons Rembrandt. Um, I'm mentioning brands here. I don't only own Talons Rembrandt, it's just the brand that I started with, so I have more of those colours than other colours, but I do have lots of other colours in my permanent palettes, including Windsor and Newton and Daniel Smith. So um, I'm just grabbing the colours which I know to be closest today. So here's my Talons Rembrandt Yellow Ochre. Okay, so that's interesting. It's actually slightly duller and slightly darker and slightly browner than the Jackman's one. The, the, the lightness of this, it almost reminds me of, um, I'm trying to think, there's a, um, a quinacridone gold that I've got. That's a, it's, it's, it's kind of like an opaque quinacridone gold, actually. Interesting. Okay, so here's your Talons Rembrandt, which is darker and duller. And then here is your Jackman's Yellow Ochre. Really, really lovely colour, this one. So next up we have a Thalo Blue. And I've got lots of these sort of turquoise blues in my palette. So I've got some um, Cerulean Blue, which is Talons Rembrandt. I've also got some Daniel Smith Manganese Blue. And then I've got an SAA Tropical Thalo Blue. So let's have a look at it. It's come out, it's rather a dark colour. So um, the thing with these phthalo colours is that phthalo is generally a transparent colour, but you can't really see what they're like until you paint them on a swatch. So let's grab a little bit of this colour and paint it on. 
So this is an unusual colour. Now most beginner sets contain a cerulean blue for skies. I can see that this would be a good colour for skies. It is less bright than some of the phthalo blues. So if I show you my SAA tropical phthalo blue here, you can see that's a much more transparent colour. It reminds me more actually of a cerulean blue. So let me see if I can grab a little bit, I've got a tiny bit left, a little bit of my Talon's Rembrandt Cerulean. It also has a, almost a dullness to it, a bit like an indigo. So it's a quite interesting colour. I think it would make very, very, um, very good British skies, actually, because um, I, I find that if you use a, a strong phthalo blue like this when you're painting British skies, they need a bit of adjustment. So this, um, this phthalo blue that I've been given from Jackman's would be a good substitute for your cerulean blue. And it's really a really good sky colour. I can see myself making some really moody skies with this colour. So in starter sets, the most common combination are the cerulean blue and then the ultramarine. Now this one is a French ultramarine, which I don't actually possess. French ultramarine tends to tend a little bit more towards purple. So let's put some on the paper. And that's a really lovely colour. Really strong, dark blue. Ultramarine granulates heavily, so it can give you some really, really interesting texture effects. Now, one of the mistakes that beginners make, um, particularly here in England, is to put this colour, ram loads of this colour in skies. It can be a difficult colour to use for skies because it's just a bit too Mediterranean for that uh, good old British dull sky. However, it makes stunning purples. Now, because this is a French ultramarine, it really looks very purple on my paper. I think this is going to make some lovely purples. I'm just going to put it next to um, one, of my, uh, one of my palette colours. Let's find here, I've got some Talon's Rembrandt. This is an ultramarine deep. So let's put it next to that one and see how that looks. You can get various versions of, uh, of ultramarine. Okay, so the Talon's Rembrandt is um, both darker and duller. And actually now this one is starting to dry a bit, I can see that if it were watered down a lot, actually, you probably could get away with it in a sky. It's got a touch of warmth. Before using most blues in skies, I add a little bit of pink to warm them up. So um, here's the uh, here's the Jackman's French Ultramarine. Really, really pretty colour, actually. So I hope you can see on my palette how I'm starting to group these colours. So I've got my yellows here, my blues, and now I'm going on to the reds. So the next colour I've got is the um, the Cadmium red so yep just called cadmium red okay wow that's a really interesting color so this is a very um a very dull almost blood like color this is definitely appealing to the goth in me it has the dullness that you sometimes find with uh, with an, a deep alizarin and um, we'll try watering it down a little more there i think that this would be very good for flower painting for very, very natural sort of rose um, rose reds. So there we are. I'm going to compare it with, um, let's compare it actually with an alizarin because I think that's the one that it's probably slightly closer to. In fact, we might do a couple of comparisons. So this one here, I believe, is my alizarin. That is from memory. That could be a Winsor & Newton colour, I believe. You can see it's pinker. And then we'll compare it to my Talon's Rembrandt Cadmium Red Deep, which you'll see is much more scarlet and much brighter. This is a very unusual colour. I don't think I have seen a watercolour this colour. It literally is the colour of blood. So really, really strong, dark red. So next up, we've got a quinacridone magenta. Now, the word quinacridone is not a colour. It uh, denotes a synthetic colour. That doesn't mean that it's inferior in any way. Often nowadays, synthetic colours are used to, uh, to replace colours that were fugitive, which means fading. So many of the pinks did used to fade, including permanent rose. Just used to be rose. Uh, they've made it more permanent. But this quinacridone magenta 
is a really, really lovely bright colour. Now, as I water it down, it really is very transparent and very lovely. It's reminding me a little of um, the Daniel Smith Opera Rose. A pink like this is absolutely essential for colour mixing. I've done a whole video on it. I'll put a link up above. But there are certain colours, for instance, strong purples, which it's impossible to get if you don't have a pink like this. It can also be used to neutralise all sorts of other colours, including greens. So do have a look at that other video and you'll find that um, a pink like this is really, really useful. Now what to test it against? Um, I'm having a look at my palette, which seems to have got rather mucky. OK, so we've got Daniel Smith Opera Rose, which is one of the brightest pigments known to man. There we are. That's pinker. This actually is reminding me a lot of my uh, Talons Rembrandt Quinacridone Pink. I can't remember if it's called quinacridone pink or quinacridone rose. Let's get a little bit of that on my brush. Similar, a little bit duller. So this is a really, really lovely pink and you're going to find it incredibly useful for colour mixing. Now you might be looking at the Daniel Smith one and thinking, wow, that's much brighter. It is, but opera rose is a fugitive colour, which means it can fade. Admittedly, I've used it in a few paintings, hasn't faded so far, but it is a fugitive pink and um, this one here certainly looks like a good replacement for that. So that's my primary colours tried out and I've squeezed the rest out on the palette. Now, I hope you can see the way I've laid this out. So typically with a, uh, with a starter brand, what you'll get is a warm and a cool of each primary and that's absolutely essential for colour mixing. And that's what we've got here. You can see it really clearly now. So we've got the warm and cool yellow, we've got the warm and cool um, blue. Actually, uh, what you would describe as a warm and a cool blue is quite tricky because one tends towards yellow and one tends towards red and both could technically be described as warm blues, but let's not worry about, uh, about that now. Basically, you've got a green-based blue and a red-based blue, so you've got your range covered there. Here we've got the, um, the quinacridone uh, magenta, and here we've got the uh, the cadmium red, so we've got the cool and the warm red. And the next one I'm going to try is a secondary colour. So I've got my secondary colours here. So I've got this quinacridone violet, I've got the two greens, I've got the burnt sienna and the carbon black. And then just separately here, because I like to keep my white separate, I've got some white here. And we'll have a go at painting this on top of some of the dried swatches and see how opaque it is, because that's really all that matters when it comes to a white. So I'm going to lay this down and let's have a look now at the um, quinacridone violet, which is not a colour I have used before. I have got three um, purples in my permanent palette. So let's have a look and see what this one looks like. Right, it's already looking, it looks somewhere um, between a cobalt violet and a permanent blue violet. Okay, so really lovely sort of mid purple there so if i pull my other palette across and we'll try it against some others now i've got a perylene violet which is a very sort of a very reddish purple so i won't worry about that one because that's a different color entirely really it's more aubergine so this is my talons rembrandt permanent blue violet which you can see it's stronger and duller and darker and then i've got my um quinacridone sorry, my Cobalt Violet, which is an SAA colour. This is an interesting colour, which I really love, but it's very, very opaque to the point of almost being like a gouache. So look at that. This new colour sits kind of in between. It's got the transparency of the Permanent Blue Violet, but it's got almost the colour of the Cobalt Violet. I really like this colour. I think it's a fantastic colour. A violet is really, really important because not only does it uh, is it good for things like flower painting, you can just like the pinks, you can use it to neutralise all sorts of other colours. If you're painting um, greens and they're a bit too bright, you can drop a little bit of violet in and it'll push them towards a neutral sort of grey green. So this is a really beautiful colour and I, uh, I'm really impressed with that one actually. So let's try the greens next. Now, when I first started painting, I didn't use any tube greens at all. I preferred to mix my own because tube greens have a real reputation for being bright and unnatural. 
and these two that I've been sent here they look like they may be somewhat unnatural but all greens can be adjusted so first of all first of all we've got the spring green and it's an incredibly bright color it's very beautiful actually it's a bit more yellow than an emerald green I think that would make a really nice color for grass you might need to kill it off a little bit by putting something like a little bit of yellow ochre in it but it's a really really beautiful fresh green so let's try the other one as well I'm not going to compare these to any um, any tube greens I've got although I do keep a few in my palette I don't use them so often I'm not that familiar with them so this one here is more of an emerald or a viridian green it's actually not as bright as a viridian so as greens go these are pretty nice I think I'm most impressed with this spring green I think you'll find that one really useful for landscape painting this one is a lovely color too a color like this you can actually drop some blue in and make those kind of beautiful turquoisey greens for things like lakes so perfectly nice fresh greens so the brown that you get most often with a starter set would be burnt umber and it's a strong dark warm brown which um, like most earth colors granulates so I've actually been sent a burnt sienna here so let's have a go at this it should be a little bit redder there we go look at that wow that is stunningly bright actually okay so let's compare it to some of the browns I've got already so I think I have yes I think I have a burnt sienna here I believe my burnt, burnt sienna may be a little redder let's try that there we are I'm somewhat in a muddle with my browns actually haven't used them for a while that could actually be a red oxide in there don't think it is but it could be right let's try the next one up yeah I think this one is more likely to be a burnt sienna yeah that one looks closer okay so here's my this will be the Talons Rembrandt Burnt Sienna. Hasn't got anywhere near the colour strength of, of, the, uh, of the Jackman's one. And it's a lot less orange, so a bit more brown. And then I'll show you the one that I most often um, get sent in starter sets. And that is the Burnt Umber, which will be more brownish. So this new colour, this Burnt Sienna, it's a beautiful bright colour. It will be too orange for some applications, but what you can do with uh, with orangey browns like this is you can actually pop a little bit of blue in them and it cools them down. So it will be possible to put a little bit of possibly of the phthalo blue in this and cool it down so that you get those darker browns if you want them. So next up we've got something called carbon black. I do keep a black in my permanent palette. I don't use it that often. I tend to go towards uh, Payne's Grey and I was actually quite fascinated by this colour because these Jackman's art materials, I've already got them very mucky, but they actually come with swatches of the uh, the colour on the outside. So you can see what colour you're getting by looking at the outside there. They've actually painted um, real paint on the outside. And this looks very unusual. It doesn't look much like a, a black that I've seen before. So I'm going to paint a little bit onto the swatch. Actually, now I've painted it down, it's, it is rather like a typical black. The odd thing about black is it can be almost more brownish than the grey. This looks somewhere between a, uh, a brown. And there's a colour I, I acquired recently, which is a Daniel Smith colour, which I believe is a carbon... A graphite, no, graphite grey, graphite grey. It's reminding me a little bit of that. So let's have a look at it next to some of my other darks I think my black is actually in my blue palette here we go this is black so let's have a look at it next to the Talons Rembrandt okay so Talons Rembrandt stronger and almost blacker as it were this one is a much more natural color so let's have a look at it 
I think it looks more like this graphite grey from Daniel Smith. Let's have a look at it next to that one. We need to water that down a bit. Again, even that one is slightly bluer. So this new black, this is a really sort of natural looking brownish black. And uh, I'm going to put a little bit more on my brush because I want to see how it looks at full strength. There we are. So it does go very dark and it is um, a lot more brownish than the sort of grey based blacks that I've got here. So another really interesting colour. It could actually be mixed very easily with the burnt sienna to make a nice dark brown, I think. And now I look at it at full darkness like this, it's reminding me as well somewhat of sepia. So here's my Talons Rembrandt sepia. So the sepia is definitely browner, but nevertheless this is a rather brownish black, a very natural, neutral looking black. And as I said, I wouldn't normally mix black into other colours, but I think that this one could be um, combined with the burnt sienna to get some real nice dark browns and combined actually with some of the other colours like the uh, like the red in order to get even deeper colours. So last of all I've got the white. Now as I've said on previous occasions if you're just learning watercolour painting please don't mix white into your colours to lighten them. It's not the traditional way of doing it you would just add more water to your paint to lighten them. So white has other uses. Now what I want to know about this is how sort of opaque it is. So I'm going to get some fairly thick with a um, minimum amount of water and I'm just going to paint it across a swatch of previously dried paint. So here I've got those ultramarine swatches. So that one there was the Jackman's and actually now it's dried. Very, very beautiful colour, very, very lilac looking. And this one here was the Talons Rembrandt. So we're going to take that white over the top. Now you would not expect a white to be as opaque as say a um, as some acrylics are or some gouaches are but that's pretty good actually I like that white a lot one of the uses that I, um, I, I make of white is for splattering so there are ways of using white paint very subtly combining with watercolour technically once you go into white paint you're into mixed media because you're using almost like a um, a body colour, a gouache. However, if you need a white, that actually is very impressive. That has um, a, a good amount of, uh, of coverage to it. So I love reading all your comments and do let me know if this has given you some ideas for laying out your own watercolour palettes. Are they super organised or are they in a bit of a mess? I hope you enjoyed this review of Jackman's art materials as well. Please do consider sharing this video, liking and subscribing. I've got another video you might enjoy too. It's all about fixing watercolour mistakes and I'll put a link to that up right now.